Welcome to Another Perspective, an hour of exciting and informative topics and views with a fresh, new, effective perspective on issues that affect our community. With your host, Dr. Leon Finney. Hello, this is Leon Finney, your host on Another Perspective. Each week on this program, we come to you live to discuss the issues that affect and impact our people. Those issues cover the fields of business, education, cultural affairs, politics, and yes, religion. This week, we're talking about the veterans that are returning home from Iraq. As you know, President Barack Obama promised back in October that he would bring all of the Iraqi or soldiers that were in Iraq back home by today, December 31. There are some who have questioned the wisdom of this war in Iraq in the first place. Some of the African-American community, when the, they were researched, clearly indicated, clearly indicated that they were concerned about the Vietnam War. 67% of African-Americans felt that we should not be in Vietnam at all. I mean, not Vietnam, but in Iraq at all. That's a high number in the African-American community that felt that this was not something that we should endure. And when we compare how we felt uh, as a people about other issues like Katrina, Katrina was a issue that I think that we discussed two weeks ago that African Americans thought that race was involved when it came to responding to what happened in New Orleans when African Americans were thrown out of their homes and by the hundreds of thousands, no help came quickly and many felt that it was an issue of race. Today we will be dealing with the veterans are returning home from Iraq. As you know, back in October, I believe it was October the 21st, President Barack Obama decided of his own volition that enough was enough. It was time to bring our troops home. Some have said that this war never should have been fought in the first place. Men of intelligence and women of intelligence thought that this, Vietnam, uh, this uh, war in Iraq was one that really wasn't a war because no country had decided to attack us. Rather, individuals, maybe thug, thugs and criminals and terrorists, really were the ones that attacked us. But the president then, George W. Bush, decided that a war had been declared. And he, therefore, went before uh, his own uh, leaders and decided to uh, make war and wage war against Saddam Hussein. One could argue whether or not Saddam Hussein actually uh, orchestrated this particular conflict. Um, we know that it was assumed or charged by the Secretary and others uh, of uh, Defense and the Secretary of State that, and the intelligence community that, in fact, weapons of mass destruction were being developed in Iraq. And so the UN and other uh, Peacekeeping forces went to Iraq to try to find weapons of mass destruction. They didn't find any. As a matter of fact, they didn't find even a semblance of weapons of mass destruction. So why did we go to war in Iraq? Well, pundits will be arguing that for, for a long time. I don't know why. Some would say that we went there because we were concerned about oil. Some said that we were concerned about the spread of conflict across the Middle East. Who knows? And certainly I, uh, as your host on another perspective, I'm not equipped to examine it. I assume that the president, when he decided to bring the troops home, he knew more than I know, and I respect his opinion as the president of these United States of America. Now, there are those who are concerned about the cost of the war. The cost of the war thus far in real dollars is $853 billion. That's the cost of being in Iraq. Others say that when you look at the full cost of the war, 
over a period of time and you can't really calculate it without looking in the out years, 30 or 40 years outward. You find that you've got to take care of the, the men and women who served in uniform, benefits, and you've got to take care of the collateral costs that were associated with making war that were not calculated at the time in, in terms of the absolute machinery. And, and so the idea at this moment is that four billion, four trillion dollars, four trillion dollars will be the ultimate cost by 30 years out of this particular war. Well, that's a lot of money. And my sense is that we have to be concerned about that. Now, without going any further in terms of my little discourse, I'd like to be prepared now to have my guests for this particular uh, hour to talk to us. We have with us a man that I have uh, grown to know and respect uh, in this community for some time. He is a retired Army colonel. Uh, he completed two tours of duty in Iraq, 2003, 2004, and I'm looking to see, well, maybe it was four, 2006 and 2007, completing over 16 overseas missions. He completed over 50 missions between southern Iraq and Kuwait during the second tour with the 111th Aviation Unit. He was the first African-American flight surgeon in Illinois. He's currently the chairman of School of Public Health at Chicago State University. He, with us also is one of his colleagues and uh, friend, uh, fellow uh, Army personnel and intelligence officer, Brother Eli Washington. And of course, uh, with, his, with him his, as well is his wife, uh, Sharon Johnson Arnold. And she will give her experiences dealing with loved ones and family members as they are in on tours of duty for the war. But right now, I'd like to have our listening audience to turn your ear and listen to uh, our first uh, element of this uh, group, and that's Dr., oh, I should say, retired Colonel, uh, Dr. Damon Arnold. Dr. Arnold, how are you? Oh, fine, Dr. Finney. To you, it's always Damon. <laughs> and this is, uh, uh, just thank you for WVON and for your show and the wonderful thing you do every uh, week you bring uh, this uh, voice of the people back to the people. And I am very, very um, thankful that you are here and that you are able to do this. Well, Dr. Daniel, Daniel, uh, uh, Dr. Damon Arnold, Dr. Arnold, thank you so much for your uh, nice uh, comment. Um, and of course, uh, I have a lot of respect for you, uh, beginning really when you were uh, with the Illinois Department of Public Health uh, and directed that department for the state of Illinois. Yes, but Dr. Arnold, First, before we get deep into this, give us a little local color. Who are you? Before you were a colonel and before you were an MD, what were you? Okay, I was my mother's son. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to go that far back. Yeah. That would take us back to the cave, uh, caveman time. But uh, I've been in Chicago for quite some time now. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet my wife, Sharon, here, and uh, we got married. My background is I, went, I grew up in New York City. I uh, went to Howard University, then the University of Illinois here, where I uh, finished my medical degree, did two residencies at Cook County Hospital, and one was in internal medicine, the other in occupational medicine, and I received my master's of public health at that time. During this time period, I was in the military, and I retired after 26 years of service. But, uh, you know, it really gets back to the point of why am I here? Why am I here? I'm here for the people who are in the community. That's why I was born. I really feel that in my heart. Uh, I felt I was born for the people of the nation when we went overseas uh, as part of the military unit. And as you were saying before earlier, uh, and I think it's very, very important to understand this, the cause of the war is not the, uh, within the hands of the military personnel that served. Yeah. We, we set the moral compass. Well, our purpose is, is really to defend this country and defend our communities and to make sure that we de uh, develop the places which are the rallying points for public debate and discussion so that the moral consciousness of the country can determine whether we go to war or not. Once we have gotten the uh, constitutional charge to go over as military personnel, the country has already made its decision. It is now our duty to perform our duty. I got it. I got it, Dr. Arnold, and I'm not going to debate that issue. You know, uh, uh, a bit before you were in the Army, I was in the United States Marine Corps. Yes, sir. 
And I served there because I was serving my country. Yes, and I believe at that time, as I still believe in the constitutional form of government, I believe that the president has the power, whether I disagree with him or disagree, I believe that he has the power, along with Congress, to make war and defend our nation. And I believe that every man and woman and person that's in, uh, uh, in the uh, armed forces is there because they're there to serve the country. And that then gets us into the situation we have now, because we have, at this particular point, Dr. Arnold, a situation where um, we've got veterans returning home uh, from uh, Iraq. And uh, uh, my concern and issue at this particular point, uh, the president made the decision. Uh, we're pulling out. And the issue is, uh, are we ready? Uh, for the Vietnam, uh, for the Vietnam, mm -hmm. for the Iraqi soldiers as they come back, uh, uh, what is the what's the issue here that we have to be concerned about? Are, are there public health issues that we have to deal with? Uh, are there psychological and emotional issues uh, that we have to deal with? Are there community issues that we have to deal with? Uh, are there issues that relate to employment or underemployment? So the question is, this is a big big thing here. Just to end the war is one thing. The question is to be prepared to deal with the consequences of our veterans returning home. I'll give you the floor. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, very, very aptly put. Uh, back in 2007, uh, President Barack Obama made a very uh, notable speech against the war. Uh, he actually was one of the very, very few that uh, even said that the war should not be fought. He kept his campaign promise and reset the moral compass for the country by bringing the troops home and saying, enough is enough. I cannot go down that moral path anymore. And he, re he righted the direction of the country itself as a whole, and not just our nation, but the world image of what we are about. So when he brought us back, he started looking, and I think he now has to contend with the issue of returning troops. But it's not just the president's responsibility, it's everyone's responsibility, whether you're a hospital, a clinic, a uh, private practice, whether you are a crossing guard on a corner taking kids across the street to their school, you have a role and responsibility for taking care of those kids. Those kids may be veterans' kids. Uh, that wife or that husband whose loved one is overseas, because we have both men and women serving overseas, they are depending on us as a community to make sure that we're supporting the people who are returning. Uh, we always, always hear these different topics about traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. we talk about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, yes. and now some people are even saying that we have post-traumatic stress disorder every day in our own community. <laughs> well, which really says, Doctor, uh, says, doctor uh, right. not only are we ready, yes. but the question is, are our troops ready? That's right, yes sir. Are they healthy enough, uh, are they healthy enough to, to be here, and do yes. we have to reach, uh, reach a dip, uh, to a different dimension? Uh, you have uh, one of your colleagues here with us, a yes, former sir. intelligence officer, yes, our sir. brother Eli Washington. Uh, Brother Washington, how are you? And uh, uh, give us a little uh, background on yourself. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Reverend Fenny, for having me out today. Uh, my name is Eli Williamson, just to correct I'm you. Sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Washington. No, no, it's all right. It's maybe, all right. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, my, maybe my, my iPad had it wrong. He's he an intelligence, so he may be from Washington. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, no. and, and uh, so I, I uh, just to give you a quick background on myself, I uh, served in the United States uh, Army. Uh, my, my actual job was uh, psychological operations on the United States Army Special operations, All right. which is an, it, it, it is an intelligence-related field. Uh, I served, I uh, actually had the pleasure and honor of serving with Dr. Arnold here in uh, 2004 in uh, Mosul, Iraq. He was our FOB surgeon, so it's always good. If you have anything in your life, you always have a, a good doctor to put you back together. And uh, So I met him uh, there, and uh, he's been a mentor to me uh, since. Uh, I also served in Afghanistan in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2007, 2008, and uh, during my time in the military, I've held various positions. Uh, one of them, I was uh, trained up as an Arabic linguist as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a native of the south side of Chicago, uh, the South Shore area, and right down the street here in Avalon Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I've come back, uh, about two and a half years ago, I've co-founded a non-for-profit called Leave No Veteran Behind that provides both educational and employment opportunities for veterans. All right. Yep. And uh, so uh, on the educational side, we actually have a retroactive scholarship that pays off the student loans of veterans who have uh, completed some form of higher education, uh, have some type of uh, hardship, uh, and have served honorably in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that by taking in donations, applying those donations directly to a veteran student loan account, paying off their debt in full. We then require that veteran to give back 100 hours of community service uh, anywhere they're at. And that's a national program. Uh, we have veterans all the way from Alaska to the Panhandle of Florida. 
Now, locally, what we really wanted to do was, was address the real issue, and that's the economic hardship. And that's usually because a veteran is either unemployed or underemployed. So in Chicago, what we decided to do is we said we looked at all the different workforce development models and we said, well, what, what way can we make a dent in this issue? Uh, I, I consider myself an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial person by nature. Uh, my director of operations, Roy Brown, who was uh, uh, district manager for all the he knows business. So we said, why not just directly employ some veterans, get them jobs, get them training, and then transition them into long-term employment. So that's what we did. We went after a couple different contracts, uh, of which one of them is where, where our veterans provide safe passage for kids in high violence neighborhoods. And we give them training, directly employ those veterans. And on any given day, our agency actually directly employs anywhere from 30 to 40 veterans. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a whole lot. That's, a, that's quite an impact, uh, brother, um, brother Eli. Uh, uh, but I think that the, the, uh, the, 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 the focus of your organization is leave no vet behind. That's right. That's right. And of course, you know, being a former Marine, uh, that was very, very important for our training. That's right. And I don't want to depreciate any other uh, branch of the service, but you all know that I'm a proud Marine. <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, As always. But, uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, we, had a, we had a thought that we would never leave a Marine on the battlefield. And so that's just kind of the way we operated as our motto. But anyway, uh, this idea of not leaving a veteran behind, uh, my sense is that that's a very, very important issue for us to uh, confront in these days, mainly because so much of our effort has been over the years is to try to figure out ways to make sure that our people are taken care of. So, Doctor, uh, uh, what, 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 what are the public health issues that are related to this? Okay, th there are many public health issues that are related to this. First of all, uh, we have re uh, uh, veterans who are returning and as Eli had mentioned earlier, who, this is a person who I have a great deal of respect for because he is staying uh, within the uh, purview of having a strong moral compass about the community and what he is doing about not just the veterans, but their fam extended families and the community that surround them. Uh, the problem we have is with the veterans coming back, and some people are able to go forward and to uh, progress and to get things done. Mm -hmm. Some people have uh, uh, mental and psychological issues, and some people have physical issues. Mm -hmm. Over 4,000 veterans, for example, have had amputations of one limb or another mm -hmm. uh, on their return. There have been 4,400 uh, plus uh, soldiers who have died overseas, so that leaves families uh, directly impacted. That's not to count those who died in combat. In combat, that's the combat. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, over 36,000 people who have had some form of injury. Mm -hmm. And when they're coming back, it's not just that individual veteran, it's their entire family network and the community that actually has to bear the burden of that hit. Mm -hmm. Now, in our community, in the African American community in particular, uh, on the south side and west side of Chicago, they're coming back to a socially disrupted environment to begin with. Right. And to come we are in a into, we are in a recession already. Yes, we are. Right. We are in a recession. Uh, there's also a problem with jobs. Uh, and people are capable. So I don't want to say that we're talking about only disabled veterans coming back. We're, call, we're talking about enabled veterans who are coming back who could become gainfully employed, can get their education, can get be placed into jobs that will dis determine the moral compass uh, within their own community, set the direction for communities to thrive. And these are very, very powerful people coming back. They're dedicated, they are trained, they are disciplined. Uh, they're very, very uh, much what this, our community needs. Those veterans who don't have uh, the support mechanism they need, they still have those qualities in them, that dedication, but they may be missing a limb, they may have traumatic brain injuries, or they may have a, a post-traumatic stress disorder, but they can become gainfully employed, they can be rehabilitated, they can be brought to the point where they need to be. Now overseas, people went overseas to fight and these people spent one year, two years, three years, some people fought th three, two tours, three tours, four tours, came back after one year of shedding their blood, of shedding, uh, even losing their limbs and some people losing their lives. They're coming back to a community to be buried, to be taken care of in a medical care system for a missing limb, for them to have psychological in, uh, impacts. This affects the public health of their family and our community directly, but why is it that we can't just give a little bit of our time, a little bit of our money 
to help these veterans who are coming back, who gave so much overseas you over got the it. a decade. You got it, doctor. And you know what, uh, Brother Eli, uh, let me just kind of read this to you sure, because sure. Uh, uh, this is kind of on your, on your side of this. Uh, here's uh, uh, Manny Romero, um, and he's a veteran uh, who lost his home. Uh, he lost his modest two-bedroom home in uh, South Fort Myers, sold at a foreclosure auction Wednesday. He doesn't have a job. His lender has threatened to repossess his car. Times couldn't get much tougher. He's living on his faith. How many times over? This is from Fort Myers. But I gain say that this is not just a story Absolutely. that is told in Fort Myers. I imagine it's told in the city of Chicago. I imagine it's told in the neighborhoods on the south side and the west side. I imagine that, well, I guess, that's what your Leave No Veteran facility or program is all about. That's right. And, and you know, one of the things that we deal with, I mean, there's two components that we feel when you talk about veteran care. First is the promise, right? The promise that when a veteran returns home, that there will be some dedicated services to that individual because they know that that transition is difficult. And that's, def that's done at the federal side of things. The second component for us is the investment. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that one of the, the, big, the best social programs ever invented was the GI Bill of Rights after World War II. And they said for every dollar invested in a veteran's education, that federal government actually got $6.90 back in extra added, added revenue, billions of dollars at that point in time in, in, uh, in, in small business startups. So first, first for us is making sure that you, you have these veterans who come back and come back into these situations, that we keep the promise that we will make sure that we provide the necessary resources so this veteran can be sustainable and successful. And that is not only to take care of the college debt, That's but right. if they don't need to go to college, that there's, there, there, there would be resources and grants Absolutely. for them to go to college. Absolutely. And at, so for the last thing we want to do, I think, is not to prepare to retrain our veterans if they need to go to college. Am I a right or wrong? Absolutely. Uh, education and employment are the two, the two pinnacles of a successful veteran. But the, the next step is not just looking at the veteran as a success story. Right. Let's look at this veteran as an as an asset. Okay. So you have this individual, and Dr. Arnold talked about the training. You're talking about a, a, a kid who's 18 years of, of age right now, as as a communications person, has about 50 to 100 thousand dollars of communications gear on their back, mm -hmm. and they're trained up to uh, call. You know, they they have enough equipment to be able to call you on a mountaintop in Afghanistan, right? And then they come back into an environment where they don't have a job. So That's tough. You, you, what, it's not only just tough for the veteran, but we're looking for leadership in these areas, and we're looking for people who have just skills and can work under tough conditions. And so now you have this individual that's outside of being able to help their community mm -hmm. and being able to look at veterans not just as, you know, just as a charity, and there's some charitable need out there, but looking at, looking at them as a good strategic social investment that can really be a force multiplier in, in at-risk and, and violent communities is critical. And, it, and what you say, the veterans are our assets. That's right. And let's treat them as assets. Absolutely. You know, we're going to, this is Leon Finney on another perspective. We're going to have to uh, take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the family. Uh, for every soldier, every, um, every sailor, every Marine, every a member of the, of the Air Force, and obviously the Coast Guard, uh, many instances that have families, they leave the family and have come back home. So what we're going to do is we're going to, on this next segment, when we come right back, we're going to talk to uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Sharon Johnson Arnold, the wife of uh, Dr. Damon Arnold, and she's going to tell us about the impact of, the, of having a loved one that is out defending the country and what it means to the family. This is Leon Finney on Another Perspective. I'll be right back. In our studio, of course, we've had uh, Dr. David Damon Arnold and uh, Brother uh, Eli, and of course, we now have his, uh, Dr. Arnold's wife uh, to talk about the challenges on the family when you have a loved one that is in the military serving active duty in a combat, combat zone. And what we want to have is uh, Mrs. Sharon Johnson Arnold speak to us as the wife of a, um, a full bird colonel uh, who was serving his country while you were home. 
Thank Tell you, Dr. It. Finney. Mm-hmm. Thanks for having me. Well, being a military wife is really scary and stressful, and uh, especially for me because Damon was deployed six months after we were married. Wow. So um, I was missing him like crazy, and we were still in our honeymoon stage. But people would say things like, oh, you know, he's a doctor. He's in a safe place. But what people fail to realize is that he's a soldier first, and he was in the Humphreys and the helicopters just like everybody else. So uh, having a loved one in deployment means that having a loved one deployed simply means that you're always glued to the news. Uh, You're always wondering uh, what's going on, what's happening. Um, You're always waiting for emails. And there's a constant fear when you hear of a tragedy, you know, until you get it confirmed, you're you're on edge. So um, as I stated earlier, um, there was a lot of wonder. There's a lot of crying, uh, a lot of prayer. Mm -hmm. And you have to stay busy. You have to stay focused and you have to stay productive. Now, did you, uh, Mrs. Arnold, did you did you also find uh, comfort with talking to other uh, wives and other uh, members uh, that you knew that had uh, their loved ones there? Yes, I did. did, You know, sort of a support group. Yeah, actually, during his first tour, I did join the support group because I wasn't sure about what to expect. So I'm just really thankful that we had email because I have no idea what people did during World War One and Two when you were there. So mm-hmm. email was a great comfort for yeah, me. Yeah, well, when I was there, it was not only email; it was snail mail, and you were yeah, lucky to get the, to when mail call went. It was this uh, letter that was thrown up in the air, and you hoped you could catch it, and hoped it was from home. But anyway, we have a, also with us, and thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Arnold, because I think that it's important for the women the wives, and more and more these days, it's also the husbands sure. that where the, uh, the, the women were, uh, have been members of the military and had to go away uh, to serve uh, as well. So it's not an easy thing on families, is it? Uh, war and combat is not easy at all. But anyway, we have with us another uh, veteran, uh, Brother Thomas Gary. He was a, a naval intelligence. What, what, so what were you about over there? Uh, the time that I was away, my, uh, my oldest uh, was in uh, fifth grade, mm-hmm. and uh, my my daughter, my youngest, uh, was in uh, second, and I missed the the, the entire school year. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a year of their lives, not only uh, obviously with regard to your spouses, uh, but uh, even more importantly for your children. That, that's a year of their lives uh, that you're gone and a year you can't get back. Mm-hmm. Uh, being able to uh, Skype and being able to uh, call, uh, even re- for those who come back for R&R, are nice advances, especially compared to uh, my father's generation and, 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 mm-hmm. and those who fought in World War II and, and yeah, no, I wasn't. Korea. Don't get me that far. I wasn't in World War II. Uh, I, I missed. I, I missed. I missed Vietnam. Uh, I was. Uh, yeah, yeah. I missed. Uh, I missed. I missed. I missed Vietnam. But here's why I think that the thing is, and we're going to have to wrap this up because we've got another whole spate of guests uh, with us. But here's what we're going to have to think: say that there is a a, a cost that it, we cannot calculate on the family for a father to miss. Uh, a year or a mother to miss a year out of the life of, or lives of their children, you can't measure that. That's why our, our uh, military personnel are so precious. We've got to think about the debt that we owe you and every other military person that has served and serves our country. We've got to remember that this is a time when the cost that we have to bear has to be shared. We can't ignore the veterans. If we don't give the veterans a parade, let's at least give them a compassionate heart. If we don't give the veterans uh, another medal of honor, let's at least honor them for what they have done and continue to do and endure on behalf of our country. I want to say this to those of you who are here, a wife, three veterans that have served our country. On behalf of our community, let me say thank you. And let me say that this program will always be open 
to you and the resources that we have in this community. We'll be open. And for sure, we'll be doing everything we can to connect the dots to make sure that the public health issues are addressed, to make sure that those financial issues that the veterans are addressed and those family issues that the veterans and their families have to suffer. We'll make sure that they, to the degree that we can on this program, be helpful. It'll happen. We are now here in the second segment. We don't have a whole lot of time. We've got a lot to get out. Uh, we have with us in our studio right now live uh, members of the RTW Vet Center. Now, this is a very, very important organization uh, because uh, it deals with the issues that affect and impact veterans when they come back home. We've got some people here with us that have spanned more than one war. Uh, there are some who go all the way back to the war that I missed, and that's Vietnam, and they, of course, go through uh, Desert Storm and the others. But the issue right now is that we have to uh, focus on this vet center because this is a volunteer effort. As I understand it, the government does not give this group a dime, and yet they provide hope uh, for uh, members of the, uh, of the military uh, that are returning veterans. With us today in our studio right now, we have uh, Mrs. Arnitha uh, Golston, and she will uh, address the issues that uh, we believe are important uh, for the, uh, that the Vet Center has been con confronted with. And of course, we have her husband with our, us, and he will be dealing with uh, more issues, and we have a, a minister with us, and then another member of the military. So uh, we've got a lot to get said in a very, very short period of time. But uh, Mrs. Uh, Golson, just kind of tell us what this Vet Center does. Okay, well, first of all, we actually do what you all was talking about earlier in your show. We provide the basic necessities for mankind, which is food. Uh, we feed over 100 people every day. Anybody who walks through the door, especially veterans, but anyone who walks through the door can get a meal to eat. Anyone who walks through the door. Seven days a week, we provide clothing for anyone who requests seven days a week. We provide shelter. Often the VA calls. They call they can't house them. It's at the end of the day. A veteran is homeless. They called. Can you do me a favor? Will you provide for us um, shelter for this vet, for this vet and his daughter, for this vet and his child? Because a lot of places do not have facilities for veterans and children, with children. And we provide that. So we'll say, if you get them to us or we'll come get them, this is the last day they're homeless, and that's what we do. So we provide food, clothing, and shelter. Well, hold on. Before I get, because we're going to have to say this several times, you provide food, clothing, and shelter. Now, Every where day. are you? Where are you? 5536 South King Drive. And right what is your phone number? 773 609 9452. Five, two. Now, I wanted to get that out because we're going to say that several times. You know, a lot of times people don't get it at the first time. So I don't want to miss, I don't want it by anybody in the radio listening land not to know where to find the Veteran Center. And that, the Veteran Center uh, is, the RTW Vet Center is at 5536 South King Drive, Chicago, Illinois. And the phone number is 773-609-9452. If you need help, call them. Now, we want to make sure that we go back and get some more uh, good conversation in. So, Brother, uh, uh, brother uh, 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 Daniel uh, Habil, yes, Habil. Uh, yeah, tell us more about this vet center. Well, the veteran uh, center, RTW Vet Center, uh, is, uh, the meaning is remake the world. Okay. And That's what RTW means? RTW, remake the world. We're veterans committed to remaking the world. Mm -hmm. When they send the military in, that's what they send us to do, to remake the world. If we fail on our mission, we don't get our ticker tape parade to years later, like the Vietnam War. And we are part of a, a, a we're Ford operating base, which means we're right there in the neighborhood, and we service the veterans, we service the general community, we service the youth. Uh, we are. Well, you a, call yourself a base, right? This a location base. you call base. We it's call it base. Fifty-five thirty-six South uh, King Drive is a base. Why do you call it a base? Well, when we came down there, uh, we had just had an article was just in the paper about the 10 worst communities, the most violent communities in the country. Chicago had three in the top 10. 
And out of the three, Washington Park, where we're at, is the most violent. So we was not under any illusion that we was not going into a war zone because that's what it is. It's a so war zone. So you set up, but your theory was to set up a base a of operations. A base operation. of operations, oh, right. Oh, I got and, it. And we recognize that uh, people say, why don't they send out the National Guard? It is so much violence in our community. It may have been safer being in Iraq. And I've got my son went to Iraq, did two tours of Iraq. He's got 13 years in the military. I felt him it was more, he was more safer in Iraq than he was in our inner cities across the United States that's a, with and, the kind of violence that's we're a going mouthful. on. That's, that, it is. So we're under no illusion. Uh, you know, every day, I personally, when I get up, I put my military gear on. I All feel right. I'm personally underdressed. All right. And what's well, the war? Don't put no, don't put no, okay. don't put a side arm on now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, what's, 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 who, who are we fighting? Yeah. If we're dying, who are we fighting? It was doing this kind of killing back when I went to went to, into the Vietnam War. Uh, there was a lot of violence and killing there. Mm -hmm. Who are we fighting? We we recognize we're in a war against. Uh, yeah, uh, but okay, yeah. Brother Habeel. Yeah. So what you're saying at this particular point is the Vet Center is there right. to not only deal with the services of the veterans that are right. returning home or that have been home for a while, Correct. but you're also there to create a safety zone, a safety, a demilitarized zone. zone. Correct. Okay. Correct. Exactly. All right. Now you have with us. We have another. Uh, we have another uh, member of your group with us, and this is Minister Lindsey Walton. Uh, Brother Walton uh, comes out of the Vietnam era. So uh, what? Reflections do you have on this moment, uh, Brother Walton? Okay, my name is uh, Minister Lindsey Walton. I'm with the RTW, and we've been working and trying to help prepare for these veterans that are coming back home now. Uh, but we have a, a Tuskegee, well, we, a house that we call the Tuskegee House, and it is 250, 243 East 115th Street. But we need you to call us and not go out there because we will send you out there as needed. And the telephone number again is 773-609-9452. Okay, Brother Lindsay. Uh, now we have one final gentleman. I want to make sure that we got a very limited amount of time. Uh, this gentleman is with us, and what is your name, my brother? Uh, Charles Everhart. Okay, Brother Everhart. Okay. Uh, I want to go back at this particular point to Sister Goldston because I think that this is the heart of the program. <laughs> uh, and the reason I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have a lot of time but I want to make sure that she gets said everything that needs to be said. And what I know about her is that she's first, first aid trained mental health specialist. Yes. Now, does that mean that we are struggling with some mental health issues? And I understand that there was a Marine uh, that you had to deal with. Uh, yes, uh, I'm first aid mental health specialist trained by the VA Jesse Brown. And it's because veterans are special and unique people. When they go away, they many times are whole. When they come back, they're in pieces. They're broken. They're not the same. You can't go into a war and do what you're commanded to do and come back home and be the same person that left because you've been trained to become a different type of machine. So many times they come home and the first thing they have to do is self-medicate to just forget what they've done and the war that they've been in. And people have to understand that. So, yes, I am a trained first aid mental health, and many times when people are saying, when they're off their medication and people are saying, call the police, do this, do that, uh, a lot of times I choose a different method, which may not be the wisest, some people might say, but I don't want to see a police beat a vet. Well, so here's if I the deal. Take but here's here's the deal. Here's the deal. I th your husband was telling me about a story when we were a little earlier about a Marine that was in a tree. Yeah. Uh, that was on. What happened there? Either well, you or your husband need to tell that well, story because it needs to be known. <laughs> well, what happened is um, he was he was in a tree. we were right across from Washington Park. Some people came over and they was telling me that, you know, could we come over and help the guy and, you know, could we get him down and different things. And I was like, huh? And so to make just make a long story short because of the time, um, he had decided that he was going to either commit suicide, either both, commit suicide, but he was trying to decide how many people he was going to take with him. Life was too hard. He was off his medication, homeless, jobless, and it was just over. And he was just tired. He wanted to just make a stand, a political stand. And, um, I, you know, with a gun, you can't call the police. That was my theory. Oh, yeah, that is killed him. Call the police. I was like, no, 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 don't do it. And so what did you do? Uh, I kept talking to him. 
And I didn't take the gun because he wouldn't give it to me. But I got him in the car and I told him this. I said, look, I'm going to take you to get you some help. But if you do something crazy, we both die. But I'm going to go with you right. or I'm going to get you some help. And I got him to the VA. When I got him to the VA, they kept him a month and a half. Got him stable on medication. And I'm grateful today that he's alive. So okay. he, he walked through the door to say that. that I got to listen. Reason. You know, it's a great story. That's but it. I got to go. Okay. Uh, we're out of time. This is Leon Finney, your host on Another Perspective. What we've done today was to delve just slightly into the challenges that our veterans are facing as they come back to the city of Chicago, state of Illinois, or to the United States of America. We've had a physician, we've had social workers, and we've had the RTW on the air. But we have people that are around this table and that are blasting out to Radio Land to help the veterans of our community. And all of these veterans, in many instances, are of color that we're concerned about. We're here to help the black veterans, if you will, and any other veteran that needs our help, because they've deserved our country and they deserve our help. And guess what? We are here and we're going to stand for our veterans. And if you don't like it, go tell that.